Um, so anyways, I'm sorry that I'm the last one. You guys have had incredible speakers. I've heard you know, people crying and really amazing stories. So I'm sorry to all the guys that have to listen to the story about makeup, but, but hopefully you'll learn something. So this is my story, and I've told it so many times. And every time I say to one of my team, I have to do it again, they always remind me, Madonna, when she sings Like a Virgin, do you think she likes to do it? So here I go. So here is my story. I was born in Chicago, and as a kid, I was really creative. I was the kid that drew pictures and played with my mother's makeup, dressed up in her clothes, and um, I was not, maybe this is why I got into makeup, to help my mother and her eyeshadow. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother was really glamorous growing up. She was 20 when I was born, and her big story is she gave me a box of crayons and told me, and a pad of paper, and she said, you know, go draw some pictures, and her story is that she came upstairs and I had made up my dolls, my face, you know, my little brother, and she knew I was going to be a makeup artist. But my big beauty role model was my grandmother, Nana, who was 4'11", maybe 4'10", and had lines in her face, and I used to just love everything about her. And when I create products now, I think of my grandmother, and it's probably the reason why I think that women look better with lines than when they try to get rid of them. In high school, I was just a normal kid. Um, I was good at anything creative, and I was really bad in math and science. I got D's most years in math, which I'm very proud of today. <laughs> and so I went to college. I went to University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh, followed a boyfriend there, and then I transferred to University of Arizona. I spent a year at the University of Arizona, and honestly, I don't remember much about it, except it was really fun, but I remember, <laughs> it was the 70s, okay? But I do remember, you know, it was before we had cell phones. I would go to the class, and I'd be sitting in a class in the back of the room, and there'd be a teacher up here talking, and I was completely zoned out. I just, I couldn't pay attention to what he was saying. I wasn't interested. And so at the end of the year, I came home, and I said, Mom, I have to drop out. It's so, college is so boring. She said, you have to graduate. Mom, why? She said, you have to. I said, but Mom, I don't know what I want to do. And she said, forget what you want to do with your life. Forget how you're going to make money. Think about what you could do if today's your birthday. You could do anything in the world. And I remember, I'm from Chicago, and I remember saying, I'd love to go to Marshall Fields and play with makeup. She said, why don't you be a makeup artist? I said, I didn't want to go to beauty school. And she said, I'm sure there's a college. I found Emerson College in Boston. They did not have a major in makeup, but I did an interdisciplinary major. And I learned at Emerson that what you put into something is what you get out of it. Now they call it entrepreneurship in, in school. So I put together a major and did all makeup for the school plays. I did, you know, for their TV department. I did as much as I could. I, made, I was constantly doing makeup, my friends, my dogs. So we don't test on animals, just a little bit of blush every once in a while. On... <laughs> and the most important job I did is when I graduated, which was I was a waitress. One day the chefs went on strike and I had to be a chef for a day. Never eat chowder from a restaurant, let me tell you that too. But that's an important, that's an important thing because two reasons. One is, for, especially for the kids in school, you can pay your rent so you know you can make money, and you'll also be really sensitive to people that are waiting on you, because it's not a, you have to understand what someone's going through. So right after school, I did a film about teenage alcoholism, which I realized wasn't for me, because again, it's just boring. You had to do the same thing every day. So I studied fashion magazines, and I just started falling in love with this natural look that didn't really exist. And I picked up a magazine, uh, during this time, and I was a year out of college, and it was a story on a freelance makeup artist in New York named Bonnie Maller, who did makeup for Calvin Klein and Perry Ellis and Ralph Lauren, and did models and actresses, and I thought, oh my God, that's an amazing thing. I want to do that. So I wrote her a letter. She never answered me back. I moved to New York. I made a business card, and I said, okay, I've got to figure something out. It was before the internet. I knew nothing, I knew nobody. I opened up the yellow pages, I looked up, and you guys from, from school, do you know what those are? <laughs> I opened up the yellow pages, I looked up makeup, models, photography, anything, and I just started making phone calls. And what I learned was, there was no job for a freelance artist, but you had to get hired and, and you had to just have a portfolio together. So I worked on my portfolio, I did makeup for free, 
for photographers, and I started putting my book together. And you know, my early pictures, if I could find them somewhere, they're really, really funny. I was really bad. But I did everything I could. I, I was open, I was bright-eyed, I was a sponge. I, my first job was Ford um, Model of the Year. I think it was the first one they did. And you know, there I was in the Richard Simmons shorts. I actually had leg weights on, because I thought I might as well, while I'm working, exercise. <laughs> So I started working, I started getting hired, and this was the 80s. And the 80s, for those of you guys that don't know, the makeup was artificial. It was white faces, red lips. You would try to, you'd go into a cosmetics counter and the woman behind the counter would tell you what's wrong with you and she would try to change the color of your skin, change the color of your nose, change the color, change the shape of your face. And it, I tried, but I couldn't do it. So my style slowly evolved and Eventually, my style as a freelance artist was more natural, healthier, and some, it wasn't the norm, but it started really taking on. So people would hire me when they wanted that look. This was in 93, it was a cover of Allure. I could use it today for one of my ads. So the makeup, just fresh and pretty. So at this time, I was in New York seven years, and my dream came true, which was my first dream, which was a Vogue cover. So it was Naomi Campbell's first Vogue cover, and it was you know, a real turning point in my career. People started to notice, people started to write about what I, the tips I had about makeup, and I thought it was you know, interesting. I also started working with celebrities, and yes, that's Mike Tyson that basically said, you ain't touching me with that stuff, so I didn't really do his makeup, but, and just random things would happen that were all very interesting, perfect for someone that gets bored really easily. So one day I got a call from Annie Leibovitz, the photographer, said, will you do this album cover for the Rolling Stones? I said, okay. So I, it was amazing, did their makeup, you know, black smudged around Keith's eyes, and um, after I finished their makeup and I turned around to clean up, the stylist came in and said, all right guys, here's your clothes. I looked up in the mirror and all of a sudden I'm in the dressing room with the Rolling Stones in their underwear. And all I could think about is if my friends from high school could see me now. <laughs> and um, weird, I wouldn't have known then, but I, have, I had dinner at Mick Jagger's house last fashion week when I was in London. So it's just kind of weird. You know, you can't forget where you come from. So I was working with a lot of designers and I was pretty much, you know, at the top of my freelance career. I was traveling the globe from you know, different locations, and it sounds really glamorous, but getting on you know, an airplane and flying somewhere you know, go, and getting up at 3.30 in the morning to catch the early morning sun and doing it until 7 o'clock at night, there's no gym, there's no healthy food, you know, someone like me, it was not what I wanted to do. I was really tired of it. I was always on a plane. and. The thing that changed my life, the turning point in Oprah's aha moment, was I had just gotten engaged to my amazing husband, and I got a phone call that Bruce Weber wanted to, um, offered me to go with him for three weeks to Bali on a Ralph Lauren campaign for the top rate. And at the time, my husband and I were, you know, barely paying our rent. And I remember saying to my husband, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, how do I turn this down? But I don't want to go. And he said to me, don't worry, you don't have to do it, we'll figure something out. I know you don't like to be away. And I didn't go. So in the meantime, I you know, got married, moved to the suburbs, and I had got this idea. I used to mix and blend all my makeup to get colors that looked natural. And I always had really heavy bags, and I used to always organize my bags and try to just, I realized you don't need five topes, you don't need five bones, you need the best of the best. So I was always doing that naturally. And one day I met a chemist at a shoot and I told him my dream was to create a lipstick that for me, for no one else, that looked like lips, but didn't smell, wasn't greasy, wasn't dry. And he said, all right, no problem, I'll make it. So after going back and forth, we made this amazing color and I said, oh my God, I bet everyone would love this. People would buy this. And then I realized not everyone likes 
I called it brown at the time, it's actually nude, lip color. So I stopped and I thought about all these amazing colors that any woman would want. Like you don't need to go into a cosmetics counter with thousands of colors. You need the best red, the best orange. So I really kind of thought about all of them. I put together a collection of 10 lipsticks from pink to beige and um, I thought this is a perfect wardrobe. I taught women how to mix and blend the colors and I thought, you know, people would probably want to buy this. So I was having lunch with a friend of mine who was the editor at Glamour, the beauty editor. I told her about my thing I was doing and selling it out of my house. She said, can I write about it? I said, sure, if you want to. Now I know it's called PR. So I gave her my home phone number so people could call and order these lipsticks. So you know, very soon my husband was back in law school and he was literally putting lipsticks in little boxes and sending them to people. And we had a little mini business started, you know, on the side. And then one day, um, one day I was at a party and I said to this lady, hi, what do you do? And she said, oh, I'm a cosmetics buyer at Bergdorf Goodman. I said, oh, I had never shopped at Bergdorf at the time. I said, oh, and I told her my idea and she said, oh my God, we have to take you. And I said, great. She said, let me go pitch it. She called me and said, great. So we worked really hard. We used our $5,000 savings. We had a partner and we started putting these you know, products together. And one day I was at a shoot for Saks doing a catalog and I was telling all the art directors about this idea and they thought, oh my God, this is amazing. You should come and pitch us. I said, no, I'm launching in Bergdorf. Well, I called my answering machine and there was a message from um, Bergdorf that said, I'm really sorry, we can't take it. And I'll tell you who this guy is in a second. And I don't know why, I said to her, don't worry, it's okay, Sax wants it. And she said to me, I'll call you right back. <laughs> and then she said, we'll take it. This is my grandfather, Papa Sam, who came here and I get chills because he, he's, he's not around and he was not around to see any of my success. But here's a guy that came here to this country with nothing and you know had his own car dealership. He was known in Chicago as Cadillac Sam and I used to watch him talk to the guys and sell the cars and you know send birthday cards to his clients. And I think I learned a lot from Papa Sam. So my collection of lipsticks debuted February 1991 um, with you know, just a little card. I invited my friends and editors, some models, and we thought, all right, we'll sell 100 the first month, and we sold 100 the first day. Now I know a lot of it were probably the Lauder guys buying you know, a few sets of them, but it's okay. A sale is a sale. So it started to take off, and they had no room for us in the cosmetics department, so they gave us a little space where their handbags were at the time, or I forget what was, or I don't know if it was their jewelry, it was out of the cosmetics counter. We, my husband who was in real estate built me out of beautiful you know, Carrera marble, or whatever kind of marble, a display as we started adding products. We were in one store, and we quickly you know, really grew, and eventually we became the number one line at Bergdorf Goodman, and then at the same time, Bergdorf's cousin, Niemans, called and said, we'd love to carry you. And honestly, the next stores, you know, it was the newest thing, a makeup artist designing, you know, a line of cosmetics. It was the newest thing. So all the stores, you know, it took us a while to get into the great Macy's, but all, you know, Bendel's, Barney, Saks, Bloomies, Nordstrom, and slowly overseas. But at the same time that this was happening, I was still a working makeup artist, growing the company, commuting to the suburbs, raising my children, and you know, trying to be a good wife, trying to be a good friend. And I think that the biggest thing for me is, was just knowing what my priorities were. My family always meant more to me than my work and it still does to this day. But the, com but the company was growing, so I managed to make it work. And by the mid 90s, we were pretty much you know, all over New York City and growing. And um, the ad is a cosmetic, is a, my first fragrance ad with, that was just a snapshot I had of me and my son who is now 21 years old. And then one day, as you heard, I got a phone call. Leonard Lauder wanted to meet us and we were not for sale, but um, I met Leonard and if, fell madly in love. And when he said to me that I can grow your business and have you have complete creative autonomy and you could do what's really important to you, which is be a mother, I, I couldn't help but believe the man, and I've never really looked back. So 
I, re I have regained creative control, and right now we are pretty much all over the world. We're in over 66 countries, 40 freestanding stores, 5,000 counter artists that work for me all over the globe, and you know it's amazing. And for me, the retail experience, you know, is ch changes, and and what makes the most sense for me is to be open to the change and to kind of go with the times. But our brand, I think, is different than a lot of the other companies. For me, it's about being simple, real, and approachable, and it's about telling the truth. And um, I'm not your typical businesswoman. I never went to business school, and this is was one of my favorite quotes from Mickey Drexler. <laughs> you know, I used to feel bad about not being the perfect corporate person, but when I met Mickey, I feel really good about exactly who I am. <laughs> Mickey, you know, you, I'm sure you've all heard Mickey has this amazing, like, you know, microphone in his office that he talks to everyone. I had it, but HR took it away. <laughs> I got in trouble a few times. So I need your guy, Terry. You have to, I need your people. So my role models, you know, entrepreneurial role models, you know, is Mickey, of course. You know, Howard Schultz, because let's face it, he sells coffee. <laughs> but you just have to have his coffee, and he just makes it so cool. And Richard Branson, who I've never met, but everything that he does, he always seems to think of the customer experience and just things that other people wouldn't normally think of. So these are my, you know, my big role models. And one of the things I always say is, if you don't get it, you don't get it. And I once had a president that would walk around the hallway and say, what is this it? What is it? She didn't get it. <clears throat> so, the way that it works for me is I have two, um, you know, secret support systems, my secret weapons. My husband, number one, because he is really my best friend, he's a great father, he's not involved in my business, he's, you know, got a big real estate business and he's an attorney, but he's just, he's solid. And when I'm the emotional person saying, how am I going to fly to this and get back and do that, how am I going to do it, he says, calm down. You could do it, and it's been really helpful. And Maureen Case, who is the president of my company, who was my head of marketing, she, you know, her job, because I can't really do anything or get anything done, I could just tell someone things to do, and she actually does it. So those are my teams. And then, you know, for me, the work environment is really important because I really believe that if you don't have the right team, it doesn't really work. And I don't, and most of the people, a lot of the people that work for me that have been with me a long time, didn't start in the job they're in. You know, the guy um, standing up next to the graffiti I met on a back roads bike trip in France, and he was the most amazing team leader. I hired him to, make, to be my executive assistant, and now he's running uh, travel retail in, in Europe. And you know, the other two girls have similar stories. So besides being incredibly naive, I just never take no for an answer. If someone says no, okay, there's another way to get what I want. I somehow figure out how to get what I want. Many years ago, we had a fire in our, um, in our office in New York, and we were temporarily in the very lovely Lauder offices on the 40-something floor, and I was ready to jump out of the window. And um, my husband said, I've got this really cool space in our town. And I said, OK, let's start having meetings there, which we did. And then he said, you know, we could build you a little store. I didn't have any, so I didn't ask for permission, I, he just built me a store, you know, with a roll of tape. You know how long it takes to get people to draw designs, but we actually did it with a roll of tape and a picture of some, a piece of furniture I liked. We did it. I told Maureen, and after she said, oi caramba, um, I called Leonard, and I said, Leonard, could you please give me an hour and come to Montclair? And he came to Montclair, and he said to me, he gave me the best advice ever, he said, Never ask for permission, always beg for forgiveness. So now we have you know, so many stores worldwide, and we probably wouldn't have had, and finally the Montclair store is getting a facelift because our other stores have evolved. But it's been seven years since I launched the studio. And details, you know, a lot of people that are in charge of companies or anything you do for a living, the details are as important as the big picture. And my team laughs at me. But this was an email I sent that I finally found the perfect black straws to go in our clear glasses, so they, they're just perfect. And you know, she, she saved this because she laughed at me. Because, but those details are important. You know, and our work um, office is also important. I moved the team down, downtown to Broadway and Prince. People are very casual, very relaxed. And you know, there's brightness in our office, and they're pretty loft-like. And there's not a dress code. This was a day that we all wore the same outfit. It was not planned. 
people wear sneakers, they could bring their dogs. We often have kids and babies running around. Some parents every once in a while come. We have an in-house manicurist. Probably the most important thing why I'll never leave my company, I get a manicure every week. <laughs> Rosa is amazing, and if you want to know any of Bobby Brown's secrets, Rosa knows everything. <laughs> you know, we all, I also encourage people to be healthy. Part of my mission of feeling good about yourself is not just the makeup you put on your face, but what the food you put in your body. You have better energy the better you eat. So I make sure that our meetings have amazing food and there's no bagels, no cookies. You know, I know who has candy under their desk and who has the Diet Cokes and that's okay. But I'd like to at least offer healthy food to people. We have yoga once a week and we have a wellness series that I bring healthy wellness speakers or different things into the office. So for me, that's all part of building a brand and it's about authenticity. And that's about being real and doing what I believe. So why, is, why do I think my makeup is better than what's on the market? Because that's how I bring something to market. If I really think it's better, it, either it's a new concept that I thought of or it's something that's way improved. I like make women to be able to put on makeup where they don't have to blend it. It's actually the color of your skin and it's skincare that um, will moisturize and hydrate your skin and do everything it's promised that I promised it to do. Our foundations and concealers are all yellow tone. That's because you look incredibly natural when you're, everyone's got yellow tones in their skin. And our colors, whether they're subtle or bold, are flattering. And the trick is our really bright colors, like the blush is pressed really hard, so not a lot comes out. Our lip glosses that are really bright, only a little bit of color comes out, and that's pretty much the bobby look. And since I'm a total visual like fanatic, you know, I usually get inspiration from things that you don't usually think about. So, you know, walking around, Dean and DeLuca's looking at all the chocolate, I, the chocolate collection has been really successful. And if you wanna know the secret, it's brown eyeshadow. And you know, women love brown eyeshadow. So it's really simple. This was our sandstone blush that was created from this amazing National Geographic picture. The woman obviously is not wearing any makeup but I see the color, so we create it. And this was from the Pink Raspberry Collection and remembering my kids eating popsicles and staining their lips. My favorite products are the extra products, which I created um, from living in Telluride high altitude because you're so dry. And we call them extra because it's when you need something extra. But the Bobby look, is, it, it is, it's the Bobby look and I can't be anything but I'm not. It's pretty, it's even, it's fresh, it's global, it's different skin colors. It's, you know, you wouldn't know it from these pictures, it's different ages too. We have the Pretty Powerful campaign of women of many, you know, many ages and ethnicities. My artists are trained and passionate and, you know, they have to be nice or we fire them. And our, we don't do makeovers, we do lessons. We teach a woman how to do it herself, and that's, the di that's our point of difference. So empowering women means that I, have, I, get, I get or I have to be, I guess I'll say I get to be in a lot of magazines telling my story. And sometimes I'm in front of the camera, sometimes I'm in back, sometimes I'm both. <laughs> I've recently built a media center in my hometown because right now everything is content. Reaching the people all over the world, reaching our artists in the stores. I've done you know, a few different things with Macy's where we've done these incredible videos that we shot in Montclair, by the way, and you know, they've been really successful both for us and Macy's, and they even did our very first and only commercial based on these incredible videos. I'm on TV sharing my message, and you, know, you guys heard about Yahoo, which I'm excited and totally petrified. I have a monthly column in Health Magazine, so that's another way. And by the way, I don't know how to type, so I've managed to do all these things not knowing how to type. I have a blog which um, is called Everything Bobby, which I really love. My husband would like me to rename it. I've had enough Bobby. He, they don't go on it, my, my family. Um, our YouTube channel, that's another thing we tried, and I have a bunch of young bloggers doing these, you know, I've not edited them, I just let them do it, and. They're a little cute, <laughs> but it's been very successful. We also have marketed some of our products on Facebook, which I, you know, it's always good to try new things. And it was just a contest, what should we bring back? And we did, and we sold it through Facebook. 
So Twitter, I'm pretty addicted to Twitter and Instagram. And um, Pinterest, I don't really know so much. But I do Fashion Week. My team now, I'm only doing a couple shows, and I'm really proud of my team. They are doing it. So for me, I'm kind of letting the people around me do more things so I could do other things. My books. And I've re recently launched an eyeglass line based on my philosophy, which is the first thing I've done outside of the company. But you know, we've done a lot of cross-promotion things together, and it's, br it's brought really great awareness to, for example, our eyeliners of the season or things that we're doing. So my philosophy of everything and the secret to beauty, and this is more probably for the women, it's really not about what you look like. You know, Everyone wants to look good, and that's why you wear makeup, and that's why you take care of yourself. But it's about being your best self and not trying to be you know, who you're not. Growing up, it was about being Cheryl Teagues. And there was not a brunette or a woman of color that was in the magazines at the time. And what changed my life was seeing Allie McGraw in Love Story. It was the first time I, that I said, OK, I can be pretty too, except when I cut my hair off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was Demi Moore in Ghost. It did not work. <laughs> But I put this picture in because, you know, I'll never forget, my mother came to me once and she said, you're so pretty, but you'd be gorgeous if you had your nose fixed. And I remember looking at her because I'd never once complained about it. But that's when I realized, you know what? It's okay to be who you are. I would love to be 5'2". That is my dream. <laughs> I'm five feet, okay? Um, so a lot of my empowerment, of course, comes from within. So being, you know, a freelance makeup artist, I've spent most of my days working with supermodels, but now I get to work with athletes and all these amazing people. And I do have a thing, every tall person, Terry, we're gonna have to take a picture, but I have to tell you, you're never gonna win because I think I got the final prize. <laughs> I don't think they'll ever, I stopped this poor man in an elevator, you know, he could not hear a word I was saying, excuse me. <laughs> but I got a picture with Yao Ming. <laughs> So um, when shooting beauty rules, I realized that instead of retouched, overly retouched pictures like my competitors have done, you know, I could not afford the amazing people that they hire. Um, and I also think there's a more modern way to go around it. I thought about our Pretty Powerful campaign. Pretty Powerful is that you're pretty without makeup, but powerful with the right makeup. Again, it's our point of difference. So Pretty Powerful allows me to use women of all ages and you can go into our site and you could listen to their stories, you could see their before and afters and just really find inspiration for someone that looks like you. And as I'm sure every other speaker, the important thing is giving back. And it's something that I was brought up to do, it's something that I do in my town and it's something that we've chosen a few things to do in New York. We have a partnership with Broom Street Academy it's a charter school for disadvantaged kids and at-risk teenagers. It was founded by a friend of mine named Liz Murray who wrote the book, Breaking Night from Homelessness to Harvard. She was a kid living on the street that ended up going to Harvard. You know, it was a book that changed my life because you will never complain about anything when you read what she's gone through. So I work with the kids and it's pretty, it's pretty neat. And also, Dress for Success, I've been on their board for um, you know, the past 15 years, and we help women go from welfare to work, and every single woman gets a Bobby Brown little kit so she can look her best when she goes on her interviews. And, and lately, we, our last thing is we joined Girl Rising because we wanted to be more global, and Girl Rising, we launched um, this past Women's Day, and what they do is they try to break the cycle of poverty so all girls globally can go to school and get an education. And lastly, I wanted to share um, my tips for happiness. And honestly, when I listen to these stories and I think about it, which I don't do very often, it's kind of like a fairy tale. I was the least likely kid to do anything and my parents stopped getting mad at me for not getting good grades because they said, she'll probably just be a mother. Well, I am, <laughs> you know, but I don't even know how this whole thing happened and you know, I really enjoy every day of it. But my five tips for everyone is do what you love, keep it simple, focus on the positive, do your best, and honestly, this is the hardest one for me, breathe. It really makes a difference. So thank you guys so much for waiting for me. Over here? Yeah. Yeah, you. Okay.
Hi, congratulations on the Yahoo appointment. Thank you. Um, it seems like a quite a daunting but exciting job. And um, could you tell us about how you plan to brand that as well and make it you know, a real go-to destination for people wanting to read about beauty on the web? Um, thank you for asking me that. My, my vision for that is that it's a destination place where women could go to, and men, when they want information on how and what to do. I want to do empowerment stories, I want to do lifestyle stories, things to really help improve women's lives. I believe in sharing women's stories. There'll be a lot of women's stories. There'll certainly be you know, the Bobby Master class teaching people how to do their makeup. What I won't be doing is talking about people's cosmetics, brand, other brands, my own brand. We will put a beauty reporter on that I don't even hire that gets to report on all of those things. So it'll be very you know, agnostic information and a lot of inf a lot of things that I want to learn I'm gonna bring my experts in and I've started to put some very cool amazing women the first person that you know we're talking to is a writer who is 65 years old who is the coolest woman I've ever met that I need as a role model so I want to start I want it to be a really smart place for people to go get content thank you okay Yes. As far as training your artists go, what do you look for in your makeup artists? And, and what are the top three things that you would recommend to aspiring makeup artists nowadays, especially with Instagram and Facebook and, and um, looking for education? Well, first of all, be careful what you put on your Facebook and your Instagram, because we do look. And you know, you certainly want someone, for me it's always about really good energy. I always look for someone that has great energy, that is, has wide eyes and wants to learn. And I will take someone that they've come from another line and been trained a certain way if they, if they understand there's a difference between the Bobby look and many of the other, other lines. So we have um, a whole makeup artist team that you know, they usually train makeup artists that want to work for the brand. Everyone has to start in retail before they join my beauty team or anything else, they have to work behind a counter. And, and my advice for people that want to be makeup artists is, you know, just get good. Get good and work for free if you have to. Hello, thank Hi. you for being here. My name is Talia Watts and I'm a student at the University of Arizona. Um, I just have a question uh, about your balance between uh, work life and your personal life. Um, as a woman going into the corporate world, um, I'm really you know, wondering how that's possible. How can you be successful and how can you also be successful personally as well? How did you strike that balance? You know, it's not easy and some weeks I feel good about it and other weeks I don't feel good about it. So I, I pretty much try to, first of all, as a mother, I always put my kids' important dates on my calendar you know, the beginning of the season, before the school year, whatever their back to school night, their doctor's appointments, things that made me feel that it was important. And so then I wouldn't schedule any business trips. I don't travel a lot. You know, I don't have, the things now are a lot easier than when I first started. I had to travel more. But I always made sure that I spent, worked at home a bit. Because when I worked at home, I could drop the kids off at school. I could literally focus and do my work. Well, you can't really do any work in an office. And, you know, a lot of my work is editing and you know, doing interviews. So it's a balance, and it's not about being perfect. And when you go into the corporate world, it's difficult. And a lot of the people that work for me, yes, they work for Estee Lauder, but it, someone doesn't have to lie to me and say, it's my kid's first day of school. So it's about you creating your balance. And if it means you have to get up at 5.30 in the morning to exercise or leave your job at 5 to exercise, you got to find those pieces. No one's going to give it to you. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Thank you.